So this book is about class, uh, mm. almost exclusively, not about race. I mentioned mm. it slightly. Um, I do. Uh, I have done quite a bit of work on race, and particularly in the context of economic mobility, you can't mm. not um, do quite a bit of work on race because particularly the uh, mobility patterns for African Americans mm -hmm. are so very different. Um, to other Americans mm -hmm. that you actually can't understand what's happening without looking at um, what's happened to black mobility rates. Um, in this context, though, I actually think that the, in some ways we need, to, we need to find a way to have a conversation about class and race and the way that they, they overlap. Um, I won't say intersect because that gets people upset. Um, but there is something that what's true about the intersectionality debate is that kind of you do need to be able to think about both at the same time. I will say that some of the, the institutions that are now operating, I think, in a way to perpetuate class inequality have their roots in uh, racist policies. So we talked a lot about housing and zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, the legacy of the deliberate exclusion of black Americans in particular from housing wealth is massive to this day. And now it's not so explicitly racist. Right? Now it's, but it's used in a way that has massive income and class consequences and therefore race. Same with legacy preferences. You, no US college had legacy preferences at the beginning of the 20th century. They introduced them because so many Jewish students were getting into the Ivy Leagues. Uh, and so as a series of measures to try and stop so many Jews from getting in, the Ivy Leagues introduced legacy preferences, which at a stroke massively cut the numbers because none of them had parents that had been there. It's actually a brilliant move if you think about it. Um, and, then it and, and, and then here we are. Now, none of them use it now in a explicitly anti-Semitic way, um, but it operates to have mm -hmm. these kind of class. So I think actually the way that the stories of race and class, and we, both in terms of the institution, really matter. The last thing I'll say is that the upper middle class is overwhelmingly white. It is less white than it was 40 years ago. I'm now talking about the top 20% of the income distribution. Less white than it was because it's a bit more Asian. Uh, there isn't, hasn't been a significant increase in the number of black Americans mm -hmm. or Hispanic Americans. Perhaps it's too early for Hispanic Americans because we've seen big immigration into that top 20%. But actually, by comparison to the general population, the upper middle class is whiter than it was because the population has become more diverse. And that's an age effect and there's lots going on there and so on. Um, but we have, the, the story I think is we haven't seen really in the last 40 years a significant increase in the number of black Americans in that top 20%. Some, and you know, people will talk about them, but actually there hasn't been very much uh, movement up there. It remains overwhelmingly white and now a bit Asian.